but he will embrace me and he will say, don't talk nonsense. You are my child. And he will shower his love upon me. Hey everyone, welcome to Godology. My name is Danny. I'm the pastor of Cross United Church here in sunny and warm South Florida. This is really a time for our local church to learn and grow in what we believe about God and all things in relation to God. We're looking at our statement of faith, the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Now, if you're not a part of our local church, you're of course welcome to come along on the journey with us. And if you're here in South Florida within driving distance, we'd love to see you sometime on a Sunday. You can go to crossunited.org for more information. We're gonna start with looking at what our statement of faith says about what we believe about God the Father. And then I'm gonna take that dense theological summary and I'm gonna break it down into some more simple bullet points. So let's get started. Article 2A, God the Father. God as Father reigns with providential care over his universe, his creatures, and the flow of the stream of human history according to the purposes of his grace. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all loving and all wise. God is father in truth to those who become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He is fatherly in his attitude toward all men. Now, in other words, God the Father controls and cares for everything he has made. He made the entire universe and everything in it. He controls all history, past, present, and future. He does this all for a reason, and that reason is to display his grace. He is the strongest, most powerful person. He knows everything. He loves everyone and everything except sin. He always does the right thing for the right reason. God is the real true father of anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ for salvation. God is kind in a fatherly way toward those who are not Christians, but is not their true eternal father. Now we're going to talk about the father with two big ideas. First, the father is the king. We're going to talk about the kingship of the father in two ways. The first is the fact of the father's reign. Nobody has ever seriously debated whether the father is God and whether the father is king. They debated whether Jesus is God and king, which he is. They debated whether the spirit is God and Lord. Yes, he is. But no one has ever debated that God is king. In the New Testament, in fact, the word God usually refers specifically to the person of the Father. Jesus shows in the New Testament that the Father is the self-existent great I Am, Yahweh, Exodus 3.14, when he says that the Father has life in himself. The Father is king. We also have to understand that the Bible teaches that there is an order, the Greek word is taxis, we put it in English as T-A-X-I-S, like the word taxis. There's an order in the relations of the Trinity. So the Father is first in the relations of the Trinity. This doesn't mean he's first in value. It doesn't mean he's first in time. It simply means he is first in relation. The Father begets the Son and breathes out the Spirit. But there is no sequence of time and no separation or division of essence, no subordination and no inequality. Again, John 5, 26, just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. The second aspect of the kingship of God is the nature of the Father's reign. What is the Father's kingship like? Well, there's five things. There are five things that describe the reign of the Father. First, it's a reign of control. Control means, as the dictionary, one dictionary says, the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. Now, we often have a negative picture of control, maybe like a manipulative mother-in-law who's trying to work out her will behind the scenes, or a dictator with an iron grasp on the nation. But the reality is that control, in those cases, while it's exercised and held illegitimately and inappropriately, is actually a good and right thing when it's held and exercised by the one with the authority and the ability to wield it correctly and rightly. So the father wields his control fully and unilaterally, yet in love. Control means supremacy, sovereignty, power, dominion, authority, jurisdiction. Ephesians 1.11 says that the father works all things according to the purpose of his will. 
the one who works all things. There's nothing that is excluded by that inclusive statement. The second way of describing the reign of the Father is that it is a reign of purpose. The Father reigns according to the intention of his will and doing all that he pleases within the nature of who he is. Again, Ephesians 1.11 says he works all things according to the purpose of his will. Father is never random. He exercises control with perfect and precise purpose. Third, the Father's reign is a reign of grace. The Father sent the Son to live a sinless life, to die a sinner's death, to be buried and raised from the dead so that you could turn from your sin and trust in him and be forgiven of your sin and given eternal life. The Bible says in Acts 2.23 that Jesus was delivered to execution, to being crucified, to being killed on the cross, that ancient Roman method of killing criminals, according to the purpose, the foreknowledge, and predetermined plan of the Father. And the fourth aspect of the Father's reign is that, is that it's a reign of fullness. The Father reigns over creation, the Father reigns over humanity, and the Father reigns over history. Psalm 103, 19 is a catch-all. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. God the Father is the king of all things. Specifically, the Father reigns over creation and over the crowning achievement of creation, and that is over humanity. We see this all over the Bible, but maybe we see it most clearly in the fact that God breathed life into the dust that he formed from the ground. That the Father exerts full authority and kingship over the human race. And third, the Father reigns over history. There's a somewhat cheesy statement that's nevertheless very true. History is his story. History is the story of God the Father creating the world and saving the world through God the Son and the power of God the Holy Spirit. Throughout the Bible, we see that the Father rules over the course of events of human histories. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is like water in the hands of the Lord. He channels it whichever way he wills. He reigns over the cataclysms of earthquakes and floods. He reigns over the first breath of a newborn baby. The Father reigns over every event in human history. Second, the King is Father. And this is such good news. Now, there are two ways that the fatherhood of God and the relationship of God as Father relates to people in the world. The first is the relationship of Father and those who are in Adam. And this relates to the truth of common grace. God deals with the world with a general posture of kindness and love. Matthew 5.25 says that he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This is what theologians have called common grace, that God gives a common measure of kindness and grace to all of humanity. Here we see, as our statement of faith says, that he is fatherly in his relationship to every person who has ever lived. Now, we have to see that there is also a tension in the doctrine of common grace. For on the one hand, while we see that God is fatherly toward people in general, he also, on the other hand, is rightly indignant at sinners for rebelling against him. And they, nevertheless, while experiencing a common and partial measure of his grace in this life are eternally under judgment and under his wrath. So you can imagine the difference between my relationship to my kids and my relationship to other kids that come into my sphere of influence. I want to be kind to those other kids. I want to help them as best I can. But I have a very different responsibility and relationship to my own children. And that brings us to the lie of Protestant liberalism. Protestant liberalism st stemmed from uh, a stream of teaching in really the 1800s and beyond that taught that God is the father of all and that there's a general truth of the fatherhood of God over all people. And there's a measure of truth in this because of common grace, but there is also deception in this because while God is fatherly, to those who are in Adam. He is not the father eternally 
unless someone is in Christ. And that leads us to that second relationship, the relationship of the Father to those who are in Christ. Those in Christ have been saved. They stand on one side of the chasm of reality, and that is the great either or. Either they are identified with the sin of Adam in the garden, or they are identified with the righteousness of Christ in the cross. They are either identified with the sin of Adam under the tree or with the righteous sacrifice of Christ on the tree. Those in Christ have been forgiven of their sin and have been readopted with God as their legal, eternal father. So he is no longer just commonly, generally kind to them in a fatherly way, but he is in truth their father forever in Christ. Some have called the doctrine of adoption the pinnacle of salvation. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 indicates that adoption was a culminating purpose of the father in salvation. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those under the law, so that they might be adopted as sons. That doesn't mean women are excluded. It simply means that all Christians, men and women, have the right of inheritance. Some people think the Bible demeans women, but actually includes women in the inheritance of of all of God's children, which was a radical idea in the first century, believe me. I want to close this idea of God as Father with this powerful quote from the great British preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones. Jones explains the comforts that the doctrine of adoption gives to Christians. My relationship to God is not a variable one. The case is not that I am a child of God and then again not a child of God. That is not the basis of my standing. That is not the position. When God had mercy upon me, he made me his child, and I remain his child. A very sinful and a very unworthy one, perhaps, but still his child. And now when I fall into sin, I have not sinned against the law. I have sinned against love. Like the prodigal, I will go back to my father and I will tell him, Father, I am not worthy to be called your son. But he will embrace me and he will say, don't talk nonsense. You are my child. And he will shower his love upon me. And that is good news. So that was a crash course in what we believe about God the Father. If this was helpful for you, like, subscribe, and share. And I will see you next time.